started. Welcome everybody to another Meetup Live event. My name is Emily. I'm the events marketing intern here at Meetup. Um, so today we are joined by special guest Erica Cole, an expert enterprise community expert for a presentation on creating a promotion plan, one of the most important tools for ongoing success in your community. Erica will cover the essentials of communicating with your members and increasing their attachment to your group. So before we get into it, I'm just gonna share a few slides with the, um, first off with the guidelines. So this event is recorded, but don't worry, you will not appear in the video. You can only see us, we can't see you. There's also a mute courtesy, so your audio will be muted throughout the event. But if you have any questions, just submit them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. There is also closed captioning available. To turn it on, just click on the live transcription icon at the bottom of your screen and select your preference. For today's agenda, we're just doing a quick introduction in the beginning for five minutes, followed by a presentation with Erica for 40, and then a Q&A session, session at the end for 15 minutes. So um, before Erica hops right into it, I will just give her a quick introduction. So Erica has over 20 years of enterprise community ex expertise. She is formerly the VP of community at Salesforce. She built everything from scratch, from strategy and programs to metrics and ROI. She understands running community programs on any budget with any size team. She also has seen massive com company growth from 176 to 49,000 employees, allowing her to adapt her strategy, strategies and deeply understand challenges at any stage. Erica has now ventured out on her own to help customers like Slack, Zendesk, Google Cloud, Workday, and GritHub to build robust community strategies and programs with her expertise, authentic approach, and trusted service, services. So thank you, Erica, for being here, and I'll let you take it away, and I'll hop back in at the end for Q&A. Great. Sounds good. All right. Um, let's go ahead and share the slides. And just one sec. Okay. So hopefully everybody is seeing that. Oops, wrong button there. Sorry. Okay, great. So um, I don't even have to do an introduction because Emily did such an awesome job. Um, I'm going to just jump right to the content. And I just, I'm probably going to try to keep um, the content to more like 30 minutes so that we can get to questions because I know that that's probably um, something everybody's going to want to to dive in. So we'll, we'll go through the content and then uh, we'll take as many questions as we possibly can. All right, so let's, um, let's jump right in here. So you already got that. Um, what I wanted to do is just um, one more addition to this before I go forward is that um, I spent the better part of two decades at Salesforce. So much of what I'm gonna share um, at this early part of the slides is just foundationally what I learned from my time at Salesforce. And what's been really cool over the last couple of years since I left and now bringing those strategies out to other companies is I get to add on more and more experience from these different types of environments and um, spend a lot more time at smaller uh, late stage startups now as well, like high growth companies instead of just enterprise. So if you're on the call today, in which there are loads of you, um, I don't want you to get focused just entirely on my enterprise experience. So I actually am having so much more fun working with some of the smaller companies, um, ranging anywhere from 100 employees, you know, all the way up. But uh, everything that I'm going to share with you today is going to be applicable. So I just wanted you to to keep that in your mind because sometimes people hear words like Salesforce and you immediately think it's not applicable to you. And I'm going to provide you lots of tangible tips that apply to you as well. Um, before I jump into the, the content and the meat of what we're or you're here to talk about, um, I want to set some expectations of, of what I think of community. Um, I think this word means a lot of things to a lot of different people. And to me, it's not just um, an event or it's not just a, a platform or a place, it's really this connected experience. 
And it's this overarching umbrella and it includes things like more traditional engagement tactics on a, on a community platform like self-service and collaboration groups and networking and user generated content. But I also see it having a deep connection with support, which more traditionally is like bugs and tickets and cases and escalations and knowledge, as well as it's tight tie to learning where there's knowledge and interactive hands-on learning and certifications as well as advocating when it comes to thought leadership and brand affinity and references and success stories. And those are just a few of each of those. But to me, every one of these is a really incredibly important part of really this, what I call community experience life cycle. And it's, um, even if they don't live all in one particular organization, that they all know about each other and they all feel connected to one another is something really important because at the center is the customer and they expect that all of those things will be tightly tied and tightly connected. So the only person that gets um, affected by this when these are all disconnected and you're hitting up your customer in all these really um, inconsistent ways is your customer. So I just want to really um, create that zoomed out experience of what it means when I think of community, because I think with your preconceived thoughts in your mind, before maybe I started talking about this, you had your own definition. And then I wanted to just um, dive into just what this looks like from a community experience from Salesforce. So that everything that I share um, in the coming slides, you can think about it in this way. So just to also reinforce that I know many of you are on the call, um, are all connected in some sense to Meetup, or, or have a have an understanding of meetup, I'm going to be talking about a community platform as well as um, events. So everything that I'm going to talk about, I wanted to try to hit on both of those things is driving traffic to a community or to community programs or to community events. <clears throat> so that's why I wanted to lay this out like this is just to explain that the community that I have um, history building from scratch and I have many other experiences now, but it has this fundamental layer of a vision and a strategy. And this one at the Trailblazer community, what I built at Salesforce was about these main core pillars, which you'll, which you'll see has to do with programs as well as events, as well as the actual online community. <clears throat> and it had to do with a trusted network. It had to do with meaningful connections, building skills, collaborating, career growth, and jobs. So this is a um, the way I'm framing out the promotional experience and what we're going to talk about has to do with these events and these programs and the platform. So hopefully that makes sense. That's why I just wanted to ground you on that. And and quite honestly, if you if you don't have this for your programs or your community, I and I know that's not what we're talking about today. I strongly encourage you to get really clear around a vision and the pillars that are driving all of your strategies. That is another uh, another thing we can talk about at another time. But we're here to talk about promotion. <clears throat> so I'll say it a couple of times. I want to make certain that you, un you are understanding that I'm talking not only about driving traffic to a community, but I also know that many of you are running events. And so um, I'm, this all applies to driving uh, traffic and conversion and engagement at your events as well. <clears throat> so the way I think about it, and I think about in general, I try to think about community and I and I like to think in, in the sense of a business. I like to speak the language of business because I think community and community events works best when it's tightly tied to a business um, ROI. And I'll show a little bit of that later on as well. So I think about this in the world of business, which is why I'm using these words that are generally not necessarily um, used in the sense of community, but I always think about promotion, about these three different tactics, and I find them all equally important. Sometimes at the beginning, it more it's more on the side of acquisition, then it moves more into conversion and engagement, but one begets the other. So this, this to me is a total package. And in order to have a really incredible strategy, there needs to be tactics for each one of these all the time. <clears throat> so let's start with the first one, which is acquisition. And that's most common. And you probably are thinking already, you know exactly what that is, which is just the act of getting new members to your community or to your event. 
And so this to me is like a, a collection of, of integrated approaches of which I'm going to dive into each one of these, but it's a collection of approaches that really drives a bunch of people to your event or to your community. And the thing is acquisition is never over. So it's not over when the community is launched or when the event is posted. It's always going to be a concerted effort to get people excited and to create a steady stream of people wanting to come to your event and wanting to come to your community, even post launch or post event. So I find this to be an incredibly important strategy. And um, I'll show you some of those tactics in just a second after I finish the definitions. <clears throat> so the next thing is conversion and, and you might have been wondering what the difference is between these when you first saw these words. So the second one right here is a very important one. Once you have acquired them, you've gotten them to your community or gotten them to your event web page or, or event page or email, the next one is about making certain it fits them, making certain you convert them from this acquisition person to a conversion person, which means they, they make an action. So whether that is an RSVP or whether that is logging in, that is a conversion. And they're heavily reliant on a really great and connected onboarding experience. So ultimately they have to arrive and they have to feel like it is for them. And once they feel like it is for them, they should be brought in. So that's why I feel like it's, very heavily reliant on that onboarding experience and having a very good and personal onboarding experience. And the way that it's measured for me is over the course of time, whether it's RSVPs to an event or new community logins. <clears throat> That's a little bit about how I measure the difference between that. And then the third one is once they are there, what are you going to do with them and how are you going to make them keep coming back? Because ultimately, if you think about it, those that's the most important bucket is you want people not only to know about your event and come to your event, but love it so much that they want to keep coming back for more or the same thing goes for a community. They come, they see it's for them, they log in and then they can't wait to keep connecting. So this to me is about that active participation contributions and it comes in this um, in many different ways, depending on what the community looks like. And it's measured in terms of, uh, you know, rates of contribution over time or event attendance over time. So this is a very important part of the business um, when you're building events or building uh, a community. Okay, and it's tough for me not to take questions during, but I figure you just go ahead and, and queue up those questions if you have them and then we'll get them over time. And I guess, Emily, if there's anything that you feel that you need me to stop and clarify as we go, please don't hesitate to jump in and do so if you see something that, um, that, you, that I need to dive in on. Okay, so let's now dive into each one of these. And uh, you know what I really wanted to do is give you a lot of tactical things that you can do uh, either immediately when you go back to your desk after you've made the time to listen to me and then uh, turn that into uh, measured results for yourself. So everything that you're going to see um, is gonna be available to you. I told um, Emily that this is something that you can have. So you'll have this presentation after the fact, and then uh, hopefully you can use these tips and tools to plan or put into play right away. So from an acquisition perspective, again, remember this is getting people to your event or getting people to your community. Some of the things that I think are critically important for me over the course of time when I've done this falls into three different buckets. One is website and product, one is internal enablement, and one is marketing. Um, and they, to me, are all important. And this is not actually in the sense of like a list of, of top to bottom of what is more important than the other, they're all important. <laughs> um, but it's possible you won't be able to do all of these, but I just wanted to put the most important ones that I felt. So when it comes to acquisition and getting people, you, Really, for me, it's a combination of doing some things that you can set up and then work for you. I call them getting their getting your hooks in them and other things you're going to have to do ongoing. So from a website and product perspective, for me, it's about trying if you can, if this is from a community perspective or even if it's from an event perspective, getting it included in the community, the community in your main navigation on your main website. This sends a really strong message to your customers that this is a very important part of your strategy. So if you're out there building a community, 
you're spending all this time creating content, creating programs, creating community events, you want your customers and your prospects to see that this is an important part of your strategy. You want it to be a differentiation. So don't bury it if you can underneath uh, 20 different layers of your navigation, or maybe don't put it only in your footer, see if you can push and try to get it in your main navigation. This is crazy, I know, in some senses, because I know for a fact that navigations on .com sites are coveted, but um, it's a very, very strong play to say that it's a very important part of your strategy. Another thing is putting event promotion or in the body content of your website, or really the community content in the body of the website. So say you can get, or maybe you even can't get it in the navigation. That doesn't mean that all hope is lost. There are main blocks of content throughout the page. So see if you can get a dedicated space on the website so you can constantly use that for event promotion or for um, community promotion. And then even better, or in addition, nothing is better than the other, is if you have an app or a product that you are selling, or if I'm sure many of you are on this call from a B2B kind of side of the house, in the product itself, you can put a promotion spot. This is a very low hanging fruit thing to do, or put it in the drop down list in the app so they can have access to it, or you can promote an event in there that's relevant. You don't wanna spam people. You want it to be relevant to the persona that's using the product um, or the service, but this is a very, very great way to continually bring promotion and acquisition to your um, event or your community. These things are somewhat one and done. You get it done and then you either update the content and then hopefully the flow of traffic starts. Some of these other things are a little more transactional in nature, but are also parts of getting in the, the DNA of the company. And that's around internal enablement. I think this is an incredible, incredibly important population of people that sometimes are forgotten as a dedicated focus area when you're building traction to an event or building traction to a community is your own internal employees, getting them very excited about it, knowing about it so that they can then position this to the customers that they talk to all the time. This is a never ending flow of potential traffic that can come to your community is through the employee population. So that's why I focus heavily on internal enablement. So what you can focus on is getting community and any community events or any event included in new hire orientation. All those new excited people joining your company, this is a prime opportunity to tell them all about the community, all about these incredible events. And that is just, like I said, a steady flow. And there's gonna be a point in time where all those new people didn't even know there was a time where it didn't exist. And they're just going to push people out to these incredible resources. Same thing goes with a sales bootcamp potentially. It is incredible to give an extra tool in the toolkit of a salesperson. They don't even have to learn anything. They just can say when they are you know, signing up a new customer or they're trying to close that deal, being able to say, hey, did you know that we have this incredible connected ecosystem and all of these events all over the world that you can go to? And it might mean that reason why they signed the deal with you. And for you as the person building these events or this community, you love it because it's bringing traffic to your community. It's bringing that acquisition layer into your community. And then finally, something like a call to action at the end of a training course. Somebody's taking a training course, and maybe it's a very relevant event that you're hosting, or a set of events, or to your community in general. You can put a slide, a dedicated slide at the end of all of your training courses that drives people to your community. So these are all <clears throat> enablement tactics. I could go on for days about enablement tactics, because if anyone knows me on this call that has ever worked with me or knows about me, knows how passionate I am about enablement, and the reason I know that is I did not do a very good job of this in my early days in Salesforce. And I think it definitely had an impact early days of why the acquisition was not happening to my community. <clears throat> great engagement, not so great with numbers. So this is a great focus area. And then finally, things in the marketing bucket when it comes to a uh, community feature or event, including in a customer newsletter, that's generally something that you might be able to fight your way into maybe a, a CTA from relevant campaigns. So you might not be running, having to run the event yourself, but instead you can plug yourself into relevant other events. I find this very effective. So at the end of an event, 
uh, you can put a call to action that drives to a, uh, an actual other event that you're hosting or a community event or to your community to continue the conversation. These webinars and these relevant campaigns might have a start and end date and your community doesn't. And generally all the events that you're running are running all the time. And then uh, a coveted spot, at least in my days, was when you're logging in to your app, there is generally some kind of a promotion spot. So getting a little spot um, to explain the community or an event that you're hosting, <clears throat> such great uh, transition from grabbing people and getting traction to your community. So those are um, some, hopefully some really good tactics and takeaways from the acquisition part of the business. So let's move on to conversion. So now you got them there, they're all coming in, hopefully flooding in, and now you wanna make certain that you do some really exciting things to get them to take that step to actually convert and then start to move into engagement. So these are broken down for me in these three areas. <clears throat> I like threes, value proposition, content, and motivation and incentives. In the value proposition area, there's things that I think people forget to do, which is to identify the actual value the attendee will get or the community member will get. They just drive people into the event instead to actually like make certain that you are saying that the value they're gonna get put it up front, identify it, and get people excited about it, about it. So make sure you identify that value proposition and then repeat it over and over and over again for buy-in and it will then lure people in with that value. So I think that you know this meetup team did a great job with this event. You knew exactly what you were going to get. You, they got you there and then when they got you there, they told you exactly what the value you were gonna get. So repeat that value proposition. Don't forget to do that. Don't assume it's there. Make certain you hone in and really, really repeat that value proposition. And don't think so much about what you as the business is going to get from it. Think more about what they're going to get from it. So, of course, you want leads and you want different things from holding these events. But think more about, think less about that. You'll get that if you instead think entirely about what they're going to get. I know it seems simplistic in nature, but it's a, a shift in your brain. And when you're thinking about uh, getting people really excited to, to come and join you, this is something you need to really hone in on. And then when you're thinking about content and really getting excited about luring them in and then converting them into um, being active members or active um, participants or an attendee, then you wanna think about things like catchy titles for posts or event names. I think this is really a fun thing. You can push the boundary as long as you identify the actual value like up above and you make it really clear. Uh, you can do some fun things to drive people in with those catchy titles, posts and event names and then feature compelling speakers make certain you really front load that to get people excited about what kinds of things you're setting the tone for in that event or in your community. And then instead of trying to think about what you should do um, and making certain that you are tailoring it to that think what they're going to get versus what you're going to get, pull them and ask them what they want to hear about. Then you'll never have any missteps about providing relevant good content that will lure them in that's attached to what they want and making certain that when they arrive at the front door of that event or at the front door of that community, when they take that step to step into it, it makes sense and it's exciting to them and it has content that feels relevant to them because you simply ask them. This is such a simple thing that I think people forget to do when you have a thriving community or not even a thriving community yet, when you have engaged customers in any capacity, ask them and they will tell you. Then there's no guessing game. And then I think one thing that's really, really beneficial, um, more specifically probably for a community experience, but also for an event experience within a community is regular and predictable programming. Eventually, as you start to build uh, an environment and a vibrant community and get people excited and converted, getting them um, excited about coming back with that regular and predictable format, whether it's like a, a Thursday tip or uh, some kind of weekly challenge that you're doing or something like that where you're, people like predictability and they like a reason to keep coming back. And then some things that I have found that work really well for getting people to you and then converting into a, um, an attendee or into a member is in particular for an event, 
I know this sounds silly, but food and booze does wonders uh, when you're thinking about getting people to take time out of their schedule. And back in the day when we actually could meet in person, this is a little bit more for that, more in person. Um, when I ran events that included food, good food and booze, we saw a huge lift in our attendees and it's always uh, a very low hanging fruit thing you can do. And also really leaning into the networking opportunities. This can happen virtual, this can happen online on a community, but this is something that people crave and they crave that networking opportunity. And that's a really huge motivation for a lot of people to attend events is to meet people like them um, or meet new people not like them. And so this is a great opportunity to do that. And there's great ways to do that both virtually and in person. And then of course, something simple like giveaways and raffles um, is such a great opportunity to either tie it to a, a, you know, a number of people that attended and then raffle something off or give them a reason to come in and then think about those giveaways. Always people love some swag. So that's a great way to lure people in is to uh, dangle some swag or dangle some raffles in front of them. <clears throat> okay. Moving on to engagement. So engagement is to me the most important thing. And without engagement, you just really don't have uh, much, much of like a sustainable, exciting experience when it comes to building a community or even when it comes to um, events. So kind of a similar one a bucket for the first one in our last one is understanding motivations, also content and scale. So when it comes to engagement, this is now you've got them there you um, lured them in and you've shown them that there is a path forward for them that matches their, their value um, through conversion. And now you want them to stay there and keep coming back for more. So I find that understanding motivations as to why people are there is so important and something that I find people skip this step often or they make um, guesses on this. This is another don't make guesses. This is another ask thing, but have concrete goals and track your successes. If you are, and I kind of said this at the very beginning, and I said that we weren't necessarily going to talk about it this time, but I just almost every single presentation I give about a community or about a community event, I just have to talk about goals and metrics because it just makes no sense to be creating all of this, spending all this time on your event and all the content and getting all the speakers or getting this incredible platform for a community and all this great content engagement internally, and then really having no goals to track against it and no having uh, having a way to, to, if it's not working, to pivot and make changes. So have those concrete goals and track your successes. It's not hard to do. Sometimes it has to be manual at first, but have those goals and be able to um, report on those goals. And no engagement for engagement's sake. I think this word engagement gets thrown around quite a lot and it kind of makes me insane. And if you have no concrete goals and you're not tracking towards success, it really makes no sense to just like do engagement for engagement's sake. So what I'm saying is that have a purpose. If you are trying to drive product adoption, say, for example, for your product, or say you're trying to generate leads or generate more money or uh, scale for self-service support, have those goals in mind and then create the, the programs and the engagement opportunities around that so you're able to be on purpose. And it also is tied to what they want. And this is exactly what I said before, which is make certain you don't make it up. If you are not sure why people are coming to your events or why they are coming to your community, then you should ask. So survey them ask in a focus group. I call it the customer's currency. Everybody has different reasons and motivations, but really in order to understand them, you have to ask. You can make uh, you can make an educated guess and then validate it against a certain set of customers to make certain you're right. And then you have your concrete goals, then you have your engagement plan. So it all works together. And then of course, there is some. if this is something that works for your community or events, you can have some smart gamification tactics tied to those motivate, uh, more like an intrinsic motivation for longer term. So sometimes gamification is very extrinsically motivated. And I even said some of that in the previous slide with some giveaways, some swag and some takeaways that way, raffles. But when you're thinking about long-term engagement over time, you have to tap into what really matters to them and get to more of an emotional connection, whether it is they're doing it for um, a sense of belonging or 
in order to drive a, a promotion, something really intrinsically motivated, um, altruistic kind of natures is really such a, a great way to, to think about long-term engagement. And then thinking about content, uh, it's just kind of like what we're doing today, uh, great feedback is to have actionable takeaways for people to put in action. I find I get, uh, I love high level presentations and I do them all the time overview, but I find the best way to hook people in and get them coming back for more is to show that you have actionable takeaways. And that is what people at events in the community generally want is something that they can, um, they can really understand and that they can take away in all different layers. And then um, everybody can't attend all events all times. And so having a library of that content to access so they can pull it off the, sh the virtual shelf at any given point in time and use it and access it after the event is over is such a simple sounding thing, but something that people forget to do. It's also quite hard sometimes to figure out where to do this, but having a library is an incredible way to keep engaging and to get people keep coming back because they know that library is continually getting filled up. And then do things like feature members and create stories to inspire. Uh, no matter what your community goals are or your event goals are, people love to see other people in marketing and they love to um, benchmark themselves after people. I mean, I know that I don't like to necessarily compare myself to people, but I always kind of want to, you know, benchmark myself. So feature members that are doing great things create the, an opportunity for that to change. So they keep coming back to see who's getting featured and maybe you're get, getting excited about being featured yourself. So these are great ways to uh, create content that drives people back in, is to continually create these sex success stories to inspire others. And then when you're thinking about scale, which I kind of feel like everybody always is thinking about scale in some way, it doesn't have to be massive scale like uh, the Salesforce community with 3 million members, but it could be scale in general, some kind of relative scale. But what I really recommend, no matter what, no matter what you're thinking, is at the beginning when you're talking about engagement, you start unscalable to then scale. And what I mean by that is that there is no better way to really understand what your community wants and what you're doing and what works unless you do the hand-to-hand -hand combat. You just can't get it any other way. So you're doing things in the early days of an event or a community and you're like, this is not sustainable. And that actually means you're doing it right because you are really learning about what is generating all that interest and engagement, and then you'll figure out how to scale. But that to me is something that's really important. You're actually building those engagements and you're actually building that reputation and that trust between your community and your members and your, your event participants. And then, never forgetting that all of this that you're doing that these are people they have their own lives their own dramas they have their own life-changing events and celebrate that when it comes to your community in any capacity during an event or during an, um, a community it goes so far to build trust and and really connection and engagement with that community and then when you're trying to figure out how to set the tone beyond yourself. If you're a one person shop running a community or you're one person putting together this event strategy, you surprise and delight to show modeled behaviors. So when you find someone doing something awesome, we used to have a program um, at Salesforce and I've instituted this in a couple other places called Caught Being Awesome. When you see someone doing an amazing behavior, you can just spot, spot um, show the success around that either by uh, calling it out within the community or sending them something amazing and that makes people understand what it's uh what you can do what the boundaries you can push and the type of model behaviors and then at the beginning uh in order to create that real deep connection with your community and get them coming back so they feel a sense of purpose and belonging is welcome everybody and then when it gets unbearable try to create a committee around people welcoming everybody i mean everyone loves when they enter a party and someone's there to make them feel super excited that they're there and to feel comfortable about what they have around them and where they can find the food and where the bathrooms are the worst feeling in the world is to arrive by yourself at a party and be left standing there all alone so don't do that to anyone at an event or at a community um, ever because that is the first way to tell them turn around and leave and never come back okay how are we doing on time here i think we're doing okay i will cruise through this i'm not going to spend a ton of time on this because that's not the purpose of this event but i want i would feel remiss without showing that i really feel like 
what you're doing, and I've already mentioned this a couple of times, needs to be tied to some business goal that you're doing ultimately. It may not be only you, and maybe you connected to other parts of the business, but have a point in mind tying it to business ROI. You could also tie it to support ROI if it's about support deflection, whatever you're trying to do. And ultimately, then you're thinking about the community ROI as well. So ultimately, the first two were with regards to what is good for the business. So this is what is generated for the business, whether it's pipeline or deal size or higher adoption of your product or lowering churn or attrition. Or this one is about scale, trying to deflect self-service costs or drive faster time to value. This one is more about the value that your community members or your attendees are getting. So this is a diff more difficult thing to get, but it's also a really exciting and important thing to try to dive in and get, is what is the value that they are actually seeing by attending your events or by coming to your community? So I put these up here just because you can think about this later, or maybe you're attending another kind of event later that talks about event ROI or, or ROI from a community. I just felt like I needed to put that in there. Okay, and then a couple more things. We'll take some questions. I wanted to put some relevant um, podcasts. This is not for self-promotion, um, but really I, I do also run a podcast on community and I spend a lot of time and energy on this podcast with my co-host, Brian. And the whole point and the whole reason is to give as much content away as possible so that we can level up this community industry as fast as possible. So I just pulled out four podcast episodes that are very relevant to what I talked about. So you can go back and listen to some of this content later. Um, the first one's about acquisition called the numbers game. The, con the conversion episode is called a beautiful call to action. And the engagement episode is a long title called post vote, comment, ask a question, answer a question, or attend a user group event. And the reason that's called that is that was a benchmark for engagement for me at Salesforce. And it's um, and you'll you'll hear all about it when you listen to that episode. And then there's an overall community events episode because I'm super passionate about this. And this is an entire episode on that called presentation, networking, and food. <laughs> and you might have heard a few things about that already with me. And then because I talked about a lot of words, and some of these words may not make tons of sense to you right now, uh, we have a dedicated community glossary on our website for our podcast. And if you see something that I talked about that you don't see, then uh, please let me know. Um, I'll have all of my contact information I'll provide to hopefully in this presentation, I'll include it so you can find me. Um, but if you don't see a word and you want a definition, I'll add it to the glossary because we're adding to it all the time. All right, last slide is about takeaways, tips and takeaways. Now you see why I talk a lot about this. So these um, I've talked about in some form or fashion throughout this. The first one I, I didn't really exactly call out, but a lot of what I'm talking about uh, from conversion acquisition and engagement is all wrapped up into a larger guide that Brian and I put together uh, from my podcast co-host called the Community Launch Guide. So please take an opportunity, pull that out. And if this is interesting to you, you can take a look at that launch guide. It's entirely free. There's no gated, it's not gated or anything. Um, number two is don't estimate the power of internal enablement. I think you heard me say this enough times, you know what I mean, but don't forget to do it. And then when you are thinking about this, don't forget to think about the big picture. Don't just zoom in and have blinders on on what exactly you're doing. Zoom out and think about um, the trends in data that you're trying to do, pivot and change and align to the business goals. Have an integrated promotional approach. So please come up with a plan and have a monthly plan about what you are doing in each one of these categories, what you're doing for acquisition, what you're doing for conversion, what you're doing for engagement, every single month and that means that you have they're not overwhelmed and you have a steady drumbeat of things that are going on don't be afraid to try some crazy things i think that when you're running events in community uh, this is an opportunity to try some new fun stuff see if it works and i think only your brain is going to stop you from a creativity perspective on what what it is you can try but try some stuff you'll be so surprised and um, I don't think you need to start this off from scratch. I love this uh, quote with the best start is steal. So steal this, steal anything else you can find and adapt it and modify it to your own, uh, your own strategy. And then when you are thinking about external or internal, 
and you're trying to really drive people to a community or an event, find a champion and make them entirely successful and use them as your benchmark. Create a monthly drumbeat. So make certain that you celebrate your successes internally, make certain you have a drumbeat of content that's coming out to your community. And keep in mind, the last two are kind of uh, connected. You don't, you don't have an end game. Now, events have somewhat of an end game, but community does not. It's something that you constantly need um, each one of these steps to happen all the time. And really, of course, over the course of time, when you're thinking about community, you're setting the expectations internally and with any leadership that this is the long game, that some of those great business goals that I showed, you get those in the long game. So you try all these things and you're leading up to a long game um, ROI and support. Okay, I wanted to leave, like I said, oh gosh, I only did leave 15 minutes, maybe a little more than 15 minutes. So that's all the content that I have. And now um, I'll go ahead and stop sharing and I will see about some questions. Thank you so much, Erica. Um, I definitely learned a lot and I know our attendees will be taking a lot of your tips with them moving forward. And thank you for um, sharing your slides. Yeah. Um, we put them in the chat. So if anyone wants oh, to good. check them out after this event, you can feel free to check them out. We got a lot of questions, so I'm going to hop good. right into it. So Heidi asks, can you please elaborate what it means to include community in main navigation of website? Could you please share an example in elementary terms? Sure. Um, I, I can pull some stuff up, but I, I feel like I don't want to spend too much time doing exactly that. But what I'm saying is that when you go to say Salesforce, I don't know if you know if Salesforce is a great example, but salesforce.com, that is the main marketing corporate website. And what ideally you have is across the top, you have the main things that matter most to a company. So you usually have your products, you have a products one, a services one, an about, a contact, a support. So usually that's what I'm talking about. It's like truly literally that main navigation on your .com website the best and ultimate goal for me when I was talking about getting community, if you're running a community, is get the word community literally in that main navigation. And if you can't do that, at least like when you have a resources section that drops down and community is there. So it's front and center in your main navigation. So Heidi, hopefully that made sense. I can um, I can pull up a couple of different ones. I know you can take a look at what Salesforce, um, there's, you could take a look at probably Zendesk, or you could take a look at um, Workday. Like all of these should have their communities, hopefully fairly front and center, but if they don't, they got to work on their acquisition for their community. <laughs> I think that definitely helps because even um, after hearing that, I know more, I can visualize what you're talking about okay. too. Okay, good. Robin asked, can you please define enablement? Oh yeah, okay. So in the in the capacity that I'm talking about with internal enablement, what I'm saying is that you have all of these people within your organization and community, I was talking in terms of community, but it also could be for an event. And all of these people are going to be able to drive excitement or even participate in your community and your events. So basically you're enabling your internal organization to understand the value or even understand the awareness of something. So you're basically giving them the tools and value prop and excitement as to what it is. So you're enabling them to be more successful when it comes to learning about your community. Um, that's my definition of enablement. It also comes in the, it's a generic term. It can be in the form of enabling your um, organization to understand how to sell your product, how to use the product, so it's all the ways that you're enabling them with the right tools and resources to understand these. Lauren asked, what if you don't have control of your group page layout, tips for attracting people to your meetup group? Um, can, you read, can you read that again? I don't understand the first part. What if, if you, you don't, don't have, have access? control of your group page? Sorry, this keeps moving. Group page layout yeah. tips for attracting people huh. to our meetup group. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally get that and that's totally true. So I would focus primarily then on the other buckets of of areas that um, that I focused on in the presentation, which is more of that in, internal enablement and really focusing on getting excitement within the organization to help you drive traffic. 
And then other things you can do is try to um, focus on different call to actions. So if you can't control the page, maybe there's other things you can try to pitch for a spot in your company newsletter. Um, maybe you can do a feature in the back of at the bottom of a knowledge article or your training. So it's not all just about that main navigation or that um, main website, which I totally get is the most coveted things. So then I would just move my way down the down the path of trying to impact other relevant um, sites or other relevant uh, resources throughout your organization and really try to hammer in on that internal uh, connection. That makes sense. Just try and use what you got. Yeah, I mean, then don't give up. I, I did not take no for an answer. Um, I got no a lot of times and I just kept I just kept pushing and pushing and pushing and showing the value that people got from my community or from my events. And I, I made them give me no reason why I can't have that coveted spot. So sometimes you it would be great if they just understood it. But sometimes you have to prove that value first and then move your way back. But I never gave up. And so don't don't ever give up. Just keep showing the value. <laughs> Honey asked, I'm one of the organizers of an internal tech talks community in my organization. Mm -hmm. The problem we are facing is the lack of people willing to speak at weekly tech talks. Mm -hmm. And this is finally leading me to my, me and my co-organizers swapping and presenting. How could we engage mm -hmm. and get more colleagues to come up and present? Yeah, this is a huge one. Um, you know, I, I find that a lot of times this has to do with your tactics and the way that you ask. I find that there's all sorts of different personalities that people have. And so I don't know enough about, honey, what your how you're um, it, um, eliciting their their participation. But if it's something like, you know, if you want to speak, raise your hand, that may be not the right tactic because they may be very introverted and they may honestly feel and I say this from complete experience because I was the same way, um, they may feel like they don't have anything to offer. So because you've been running this event and this group maybe for a while, you may understand who has value to share. They may not literally know they have value to share because people sometimes don't even know what they know. And um, so it might be a way of taking different tactics to get to them, either directly uh, saying, pulling somebody aside and saying, you know, this may be your first time and but I, I know you have an incredible story to share. Can I, what can I do to take all the effort off of you um, to get you to tell that story, do tons of the work on your own, um, maybe allow them to share it just for the first time in a slide or a success story or a, a use case or best practice. And then I bet you that will start to show people like, oh, I have something to share. And then, mm -hmm. um, and, to, and we could go on and on for this kind of thing for a while, but uh, just love on that person as much as you possibly can. Give them whatever they need. So back to that, uh, that understanding their motivations and currency, figure out what, what makes them tick and give them all that, whether it's uh, promotion within your internal organization, an email to their manager, uh, um, chocolate, I don't know, whatever it is that makes them happy. And then other people will see, oh, that didn't seem so hard. I actually have something to share and maybe I'll get some chocolate or maybe an email to my boss. So it's to me, it's like, a, and I and I don't, honey, I don't wanna assume that I know maybe you've done all these things, but these are just some things that popped to my mind when I was having trouble getting people to step up and share some value. I've definitely heard that too, um, kind of pulling people aside before and asking mm -hmm. them instead of putting them on the spot, maybe that right. will make them feel more comfortable. Yeah. Roy asked, what is the relationship between the customer believing in the product and belonging to a community? What, what is the tie? What was the first part? What is the relationship between the customer believing in the product and belonging to a community? Um, oh, wow, that's such a that's such a philosophical type of question. <laughs> um, so I firmly believe that, uh, you know, there that maybe the initial reason to join a community um, depending on, it's impossible with uh, 268 people on this call to know what everybody's um, connection is, but generally maybe one of them is that they use the product. But there's an incredible way to then drive more connection and value than just the product. So a community, it, to me, is not just about getting your questions answered using the product. 
it's more about connecting like minded people who are struggling maybe with the same problem or need a workaround or a solution. So now you're taking it to another level where you're now connecting people that um, they maybe never knew before. And then there's this change that again, it's over, this is over generalizing how quickly this happens, but over time, then you've got your connection, you've got learning, you're providing them with all of these resources to be more successful in their world. Let's just say they get an incredible new job. Now they feel connected to the people and the business that provided this environment for them to get a job that maybe they never dreamed that they could get. So now they have this connection to the brand and to the people, and now they want to turn on and give that same experience back. So you're now creating this real emotional tie and this real connection that that you never thought could exist from just the product. So that's how you get a really um, engaged and, and connected experience that far surpasses a product uh, connection. So um, is it Roy? Was Roy asked yeah. that question? Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully Roy, that, that just fast forwarded how I think about it and the way I think um, of, of really a connected experience from a, a product-based community. Lauren asked, I don't have the ability to hire speakers or pay for food, alcohol, mm -hmm. or giveaways for my meetup mm -hmm. events. What are mm -hmm. some tips that would apply to meetup? So I, I actually didn't have, um, it, you know, we created an environment, a big, big scale environment. So we couldn't pay for very much at all for our meetup um leaders either and and i don't know again if this would apply to you but what we ended up doing for an extra oomph to their event was a partnerships so sponsorships and partnerships that they formed on their own so somebody that had a vested interest in whatever content or the people that were going to be there and then creating an environment where they could maybe um have a flyer that you could pa pass out at the meetup and then they would provide um, a little extra food and maybe some uh, drinks at your event. That's one thing we did to supplement. Um, other things you can do in order to uh, drive people to your event is, and I, and I have no idea what your environment is that you're bringing this question forward, but what you can control is marketing your event. So it, the way I felt what, uh, what my meetup organizers wanted um, is they wanted promotion of their event because they couldn't do that on their own. So they're like, that's your job. You need to figure that out. So I connected with all parts of my organization, back to that internal enablement, and I provided them easy ways to promote the events in their area so that whenever they were talking to customers, they would say, oh, hey, you, you're in the you know Salt Lake City area. There's a Salt Lake City user group going on that you might not have even known about, and then they're driving traffic. Ultimately, what I think you want as a, an organizer is people to come to your event <laughs> because when people come to your event, they connect deeper, they get value, and then they get to be more successful. So it's not all just about money. In fact, I did so much with so little. So I think it's just about lev using these levers and these tactics in the best possible way to drive to drive people to these events. So that was just an example about food and food and booze. It wasn't like the catch all to the only thing. It was just a, a, an example. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great tip. Um, I've definitely heard of organizers too who use sponsors. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty popular. And now I hold on for one second, Emily. I want to make certain that I I don't over rotate on that either. That you know, it's not you don't want to sell yourself out either. You don't want it to be this like giant sales pitch or partner show. So it is a balance, but it can do wonders if they're willing to to listen and learn and provide relevant content to the group mm -hmm. in exchange. So I want to just say that because I know someone's out there saying I'm not gonna, you know, <laughs> I'm not gonna like sell out my group just so I can have booze. <laughs> <laughs> Anonymous asked ideas to keep pe people from being so clicky that they mm. aren't welcoming to new people. I witnessed it online and in person with many groups. Mm. Yeah, gosh, such a good question. I think that this is when I think about model behavior and and um, recognizing and, and rewarding that kind of model behavior. And maybe you need to force yourself 
it may feel really unnatural and uh, at first, but I always remember my mom saying that in order to change behaviors, you have to do that really uncomfortable stuff for a while until it starts to feel comfortable. And so maybe you need to set up a, an environment if you know there's clickiness going on, where you force people to distribute themselves, whether it's like, <clears throat> you know, I'm only thinking in person because I'm dreaming of the time we get to go back, but forcing people to sit next to different people than they ever did or, um, pairing people up side by side and having them introduce one another, um, you know, having that like speed dating kind of thing where you learn about someone for one minute and then swap and then have to like tell them about that person. So you're breaking up different groups of people. Um, and, and I suppose you can do that online as well. There's different icebreaker and force tactics that you can do. It might feel uncomfortable, but I think that if you are seeing that, then um, that's that's just two that pop to my brain that I think could work. So we have time for, I think, one more question. So okay. VM asks, can you please re-explain start unscalable to then scale and give oh, an yeah. example? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, OK, so what I meant by unscalable is at the very beginning, and this, my brain goes to more of a community. When you're starting a community from scratch or really starting anything, um, you really have to do the real one-to-one, -one, hand hand-to-hand combat kinds of things. So an example that I can give you is one I love. So I had an early day community that I was building and one guy was answering a lot of questions. And I, um, I wanted to basically like, I was behind the scenes, he was helping answer questions and other people were also not jiming in yet to answer questions. So behind the scenes, I was going and finding the right person to answer those questions. And then I was literally giving answers to other people to say, hey, they don't wanna hear from me. Can you answer these questions? I know you can answer these questions. Here's the answer. And really like almost doing like a puppeteering act behind the scenes, not scalable. That is not a way. But what I wanted to do was eventually start to see some engagement happen on their own. And so for a while I was doing the back behind the scenes manipulation. And then when I finally started seeing something happen on its own, that peer to peer engagement, I poured all my effort and excitement into that person. And I rewarded and recognized that in ways that matter directly to, to their currency. Like I would literally send them beer on uh, like on dry ice in the mail, their favorite beer, or, you know, these kinds of like, Again, not scalable tactics, but mean so much at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that makes sense. And then eventually there's, you know, you're building that up for a peer-to-peer -peer engagement environment that scales much better than me running around bribing internal employees to answer questions and get the questions answered. <laughs> so I know um, I said that was the last question, but we got one question. Mm -hmm. She says, um, her name's Erica. She says she's a big fan of yours. So oh, I'm gonna thanks. read her question. Okay. I also think it's relatable. So okay. she said, um, I'm curious if you've heard recently of any cool incentives that have worked well to boost RSVPs and check-ins for community events. Our event leaders are great at promoting the events, mm -hmm. but are struggling with Zoom fatigue and lots of competing virtual events. Mm, gosh, that's so good. So incentives to attend your event versus any of the other bajillions of events? Yeah, gosh, that's a really good question. I, um, I'm struggling to figure that out myself, but I think that, you know, some of the tactics that I put forward, like some of these leading with value, I know that it's an easy way out to just go back to the content that I presented, but it truly does, like making certain that you're presenting something unique with really awesome speakers that you can try to drum up and tap into your network. And then maybe there's a way to, connect some sort of a personal personalness to this about um like for every attendee if you can do this for every attendee that comes you're going to donate to a local charity if it's a local meetup i know that there's a lot of things going on in i live in boulder colorado and it's a lot of stuff going on in boulder that if i saw an event that was going to donate money to the to the fire fund that's going on from the big huge fires we had i would for sure attend that event even if I had a competing event. So maybe there's a way to make some kind of an emotional connection um, to what's going on in that local area that um, instead of spending money on a, a fancy giveaway or even swag, uh, that's what is part of your event, maybe making it a, an emotional connection. Cause I find that that matters most right now mm -hmm. to people. We're all having a rough go 
about all of this. So um, that's something that I think I would try. Yeah, that's a great tip. Thank you. Um, so thank you again for joining us and sharing so yeah. many great tips with us. Yeah. I am actually going to share your resources in the chat right now. So if you guys okay. want to check out her podcast. And put, put my name too, because I didn't put that on my slides. I was going to update that and you already shared the slide. So anyone and everyone can find me on this if you're still on. My name is Erica with a C and my name is Cool, K-U-H-L, not C-O-O-L. And basically if you search me up, um, you'll find me Twitter, LinkedIn, wherever you want to find me, you'll find me as, as well as my website. Yeah, thank you, Emily. Mm -hmm. It's perfect. Yep, no problem. So um, before we go, I'm just going to share a few quick slides. So the first slide is just um, if you become a Meetup member, you can save 30% off your first subscription by going to meetupsavings.com. And we also launched a podcast with our a podcast, Keep Connected, with our CEO last year. If you want to check it out, just be sure to take your phone out and scan this QR code. We have a lot of great podcasts up. And as a quick reminder, you can view a recap of this event in, our few, in a few days on our Community Matters blog at meetup.com slash blog. So thanks again for everyone who joined us and have a great rest of your day. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.